Hey everybody, it's Tony here with my review of Mozart's Idomeneo with conductor Pierre de Musso, which I saw at the Staatsoper Unter den Linden. This marks the second time I saw this production of Mozart's Elektra at the Staatsoper Unter den Linden because I wanted to see and hear Saimir Pirgu perform the role of Idomeneo. I've been following Mr. Pirgu's career for nearly 15 to 16 years, from his beginnings as a light lyric tenor in the role of Rinuccio, to singing more lyrical tenor roles such as Rodolfo, and even to his more recent portrayal of Don Jose, I have seen him grow from strength to strength, whether it's from his repertoire or from his engagement in a lot of the world's opera houses. So hearing him as Idomeneo did make me feel quite excited because I have seen him grow and mature from singing these light lyric tenor roles to singing more leading male roles in a lot of the world's opera houses. I really enjoyed his charismatic stage presence. I love the way that he was able to make Idomeneo a conflicted king and father figure who also lives by the rules of fate. And I also loved the way that he was able to launch at some electrifying top notes, as well as have the appropriately steely and full quality necessary for any tenor taking on Idomeneo. While I did manage to find loads of laudability in his stage performance as well as the way he was able to make his voice carry out throughout the theater, I did have a few reservations when it came to his singing. First of all, he had issues with maskiness, and every time he sang in the mask, he tended to sound nasal, he tended to sound whispery in certain areas, and there were times that he had to result to making all of these weird facial expressions in order to sing the coloratura in For del Mar. It's kind of awkward just watching someone who simultaneously launches those high notes, but then have all these weird facial expressions when trying to have a go at the coloratura and sing white maskily and turn this otherwise heroic performance into something that is quite conflicting. Perhaps I'm just spoiled by my choices of my personal favorite Idomeneos of the past, which include Valdemar Kment, Luciano Pavarotti, Peter Schreier, and my personal favorite of all time, Wislav Ochmann. In the cases of Kment, Pavarotti, and Ochmann, these tenors had the appropriate fullness and richness of their voices. And in Pavarotti's case, he was the complete package. And I know that he's technically a light lyric tenor, but the role of Idomeneo fit him like a glove when he performed it at the Metropolitan Opera House during the 1980s. With Saimir Pirgu, Yes, the reservations I had with his maskiness and the tendency to sound nasal in certain areas and the tendency to resort to singing in the mask to sing all those coloratura passages left a lot to be desired. However, his strong stage presence and the way that he was able to launch at those high notes with full abandon make me admire him regardless of whatever vocal flaws that he had. So I still have to give Saimiro Pirgu loads of credit for embodying this king and really having a go at launching some electrifying top notes. Friedrich Hamel might have been throaty as the voice of Neptune, but he still had sufficient fullness to make the voice of Neptune work. Yes, he still needs to work on getting rid of his throaty projection, getting rid of his woofiness, and getting rid of whatever vocal inhibitions he has by singing more pharyngeally and not in the mask. But his timbre was still nicely rich to listen to, 
and he does continue to show a lot of promise with everything that he's got so far and he still continues to show a lot of promise with the material that is presented to him. Andres Moreno Garcia stole the show as Arbache and it's all thanks to his beautiful, focused, well-projected and absolutely masculine yet velvety lyric tenor voice that made me fall in love with him and his overall performance as Arbache. I have seen this tenor grow from strength to strength. I have seen him perform the role of Borsa four years ago at the same opera house and I knew from then on there that this was a tenor destined for greatness and destined for way more leading man roles. And while Arbacha is far from being a leading man, he is still a substantial character to the plot, all thanks to the music that he not only has to sing, but also the overall plot that Arbacha is involved in as the king's advisor. And yes, there have been more vocally present singers such as Frank Little and Werner Holweg, but Andres Moreno Garcia's peerless musicianship and absolute strength as both a vocal actor and an overall singer made him shine like the most brilliant of stars and there's also an equally great future for him, not only as Rodolfo, but also as Ruggiero Lastuc and Nadir from Le Pecheur de Perle, as well as, maybe in four to five years' time, Edgardo Ravenswood from Donizetti's Lucia di Lammermoor. The possibilities for Andres Moreno Garcia are absolutely endless, so long as he continues to grow his technique in the best possible way, and even sing more of his chest tones, all covered, and even make sure that everything is well projected from bottom to top, and also keep on preserving that naturally beautiful lyric tenor voice of his, because that voice is certainly gonna go places. Andres Moreno Garcia stood head and shoulders above the rest as a shining star and an absolutely great standout among the cast. Florian Hoffmann might have shown some nasality as the high priest of Neptune, but he still has his strong stage presence to make him a sufficiently charismatic singer, and he was also able to do well with what material he had as this character role. Sure, he could sing a lot more pharyngeally. Sure, he could sing with a lot more covered chest tones, but he still had a striking stage presence that made me totally invested in this character part. Olga Peretiatko might still be able to give Eletra elegance and never forget that she is a princess and of royal blood who also imbues the scene with her beauty as well as her regality, especially when she's accompanied by her two handmaidens of the underworld. And I still kind of enjoyed the way she was able to launch at that top C after singing Doreste Daiace. However, that still does not mean that I totally like her in the role, because I am still extremely confused Inflicted, as a total understatement of the century, of Olga Peretarko's performance as Aletra. While I still enjoy her regality, elegance, and nobility as this princess, I am still not crazy for her overly light voice for this otherwise prima donna dramatic coloratura soprano role. There were occasions where she sounded undervoiced, and she was insufficiently hefty for this princess to the point where I was praying for someone 
who is actually a real dramatic coloratura soprano of today, such as Marina Rebecca, to simply replace her in this role. We could have also had the likes of Jessica Pratt or Albina Shagimuratova or even Hulkar Sabirova, who is so well known for her technical precision and overall vocal beauty. That is not to say that Olga Peretiarko was bad. In fact, there were occasions where I did enjoy parts of her voice when she was able to sing Idol Mio with sufficient beauty and sufficient charm, and she was able to launch at some high notes, even though they don't really sound as full, let alone as rich as any true dramatic color to a soprano should launch at them. But it is still too little too late, as I believe that Olga Paratiatko's vocal resources leave so much to be desired. Just give me real dramatic coloratura sopranos, let alone sopranos who have the right vocal size as a letra, such as Ray Woodland, Joan Sutherland, Leila Gencher, Eda Moza, Carol Neblet, Luciana Serra, especially in the 1990s, and Mariela Devia when she took on the role of Eletra, and even Roberta Alexander. Those sopranos had fuller, richer voices and way more imposing voices to sing the role of Eletra, especially where the likes of Joan Sutherland and Carol Neblet are concerned. Joan Sutherland had the ringing top notes to make Eletra fierce and furious while still being noble, while Carol Neblet had the complete package of steeliness and flexibility to make her vocal performance come alive, and if we're looking for the other complete package of sounding full and rich while being agile throughout the registers, look no further than Eda Moza, who can just do it all. With Olga Peretiatko, I still feel like her voice was still a tad bit too light as Eletra, and should actually sing a lot more of the light lyric soprano roles to preserve whatever lyricism was there in her voice. She should actually just stop trying to conquer the dramatic coloratura soprano repertoire because she never had a dramatic coloratura soprano voice. At most, Olga Peretetko's voice is a light lyric soprano who should actually be singing Ilya, Pamina, and even Melisande. She should just leave the dramatic coloratura soprano roles altogether and just stop singing the likes of Anna Bolena, Eletra, and Lucrezia Borgia and leave those roles to the big girls. Even with those vocal caveats aside, I still enjoyed whatever elegance Olga Peretiarco managed to imbue as Eletra, although I still desire a steelier, fuller, rounder, richer, dramatic coloratura soprano to take on Eletra, not someone who is naturally a light lyric as Olga Peretiatko. Ana Stefani was charming and absolutely beautiful as Ida Mante in terms of her stage presence and the charm and charisma she was able to provide in this heroic role. And while I do like the creaminess of tone when she opened her mouth to sing, I am not crazy with how she tended to forget to coordinate head voice and chest voice. And that said uncoordination caused her to sound hollow in the lower parts of her voice. She tended to sound inaudible, and there were occasions where she tended to vanish when she didn't have her solo numbers, let alone when she was singing with an ensemble. There was no doubt that the issues of her vanishing from the ensemble and vanishing from whatever duets, let alone trios and quartets she had with her fellow singers was the result of singing in a collapsed head voice as well as not coordinating 
head voice and chest voice. It says something when mezzo-sopranos who could also do some soprano roles such as Trudelisa Schmidt, Agnes Balza, Frederica von Stade, and Maria Ewing had way more coordination in their registers and especially where Agnes Balza is concerned coordinated chest tones. In fact, I highly suggest, let alone recommend, Anna Stefani to follow Agnes Balza's example of coordinating head voice and chest voice, singing in coordinated chest tones to make sure that she gains in clarity, gains in vocal strength, and gains in vocal presence. The material that Anna Stefani has is absolutely beautiful. It's just that I do not want to see her squander her talents by not coordinating her head voice and chest voice, let alone giving in to some bad habits. She's still able to pull off a fine and dashing stage presence, but she definitely needs to keep on working on her technique if she is to gain in clarity and gain in more vocal presence, let alone strengthen her vocal presence. I have mainly known Melissa Petit in a lot of these charmingly delicious and absolutely gorgeous soubrette soprano roles, starting off with Papagena, Barbarina, and Frasquita, before graduating to slightly more lyrical roles such as Gilda from Verdi's Rigoletto and Juliette from Gounod's Romeo et Juliette. The results have been kind of varying because her voice, while it does show a lot of presence in terms of that silvery timbre and that sweetness that has made her very well known in roles like Papagena, Barbarina, Frasquita, and these days with Pamina, Juliette, and Gilda, I thought that her voice was a tad bit too light and small for Ilya. Don't get me wrong, Melissa Petit is a consummate musician. She was able to make her voice float so serenely in the very lyrical passages, and her silvery timbre was what made her performance of Ilya win in my eyes and do so in a way that made her stand out in elegance, charm, lovability, girlishness, and sensitivity. In fact, sensitivity is the word I'm going to use for her performance as Ilya. She sang the role with so much sensitivity, so much heart, and so much emotional investment that I was quite taken aback with how she was able to embody this young princess. However, this is sort of where my praise ends because while I do like that light and silvery quality that Melissa Petit had, I thought that it was still not enough to make Ilya a fully charismatic and a fully realized character. After all, sounding pretty and nice does not always cut it for Ilya. I should know because a lot of the light lyric and lyric colorature sopranos of the past such as Lisa de la Casa, Judith Raskin, Pilar Lorengar, Christiane Edapierre, Ileana Cotrubash, Mariela Devia, and Yvonne Kenny have sung this role with a lot more vocal beauty and more heft, especially where Pilar Lorengar and Ileana Kotrubash are concerned. With Pira Lorengar, she had more heft, and she also took advantage of her silvery lyric soprano voice to make roles like Ilya and Pamina work in her favor, while Ileana Kotrubash not only had that silvery light lyric soprano voice, which could also be capable of singing coloratura soprano roles like Amina, from Bellini's La Sonambula, as well as Violetta from Traviata, but she also had well-coordinated chest tones and an equally complete instrument that made 
her so well loved in the opera world, Melissa Petit's vocal problems do not just limit in terms of her voice being a tad bit too light for Ilya, almost to the point where it is light to a fault. But there were occasions where she didn't coordinate head voice and chest voice, and there were times that the low notes disappeared, they couldn't be heard, and they were pretty inaudible. Sure, her pleasant tambre was a major asset as Ilya, but I still wish for a lot more color, charisma, and a bit more heft as Ilya, because Melissa Petit has beautiful material to work with, it's just that she not only needs to be very careful with her choice of repertoire, but make sure that A, she doesn't take in too much too soon, and B, preserve her naturally lovely light lyric soprano instrument by taking on roles that are appropriate for her and that can also be able to make her show off some beautiful legato singing while continuing to develop her technique in the best way possible. There was also some equally fine singing to be found in Maria Kokareva's and Rebecca Valgot's charming Cretan women, especially where Maria Kokareva's lovely light lyric soprano voice and Rebecca Valgot's fine lyric mezzo voices are concerned. And lest I forget about Gonzalo Quinchawal's and Dionysios Avgerinos's handsomely sung Trojan men, all thanks to Gonzalo Quinchawal's ever beautiful and ever lovely lyric tenor voice and Dionysios Avgerinos's potential for good singing using his baritone slash bass baritone voice. So overall, the singing was quite good for the most part. While I did enjoy Saimir Pirgu singing the heck out of Idomeneo, even with his vocal flaws, I also enjoyed the way that he was able to just launch at those top notes, and I still feel that he does need to stop with mask singing and just sing a lot more pharyngeally if he is to sound fuller and way more incisive as a naturally handsome tenor. The major hero for tonight was none other than Andres Moreno Garcia's handsomely sung and beautifully toned Arbache, who was able to make great music out of his role, as well as be naturally fine in this particular role with no gimmicks, no showing off, and just make his voice pour out with that beautiful covered tone, as well as great musicianship that made him stand head to toe above everybody else tonight. The other performances found in Friedrich Hamel's solid voice of Neptune, Florian Hoffmann's equally solid high priest of Neptune, Olga Peretiatko's usually elegant yet unfortunately undervoiced Elettra, Anna Stephanie's charming Idamante, although she still needs to work on her chest tones and really coordinate head voice and chest tones well, and Melissa Petit's charming Ilya, although she is still kind of subretish in her emission, let alone the natural innate quality of her voice, which also kind of makes the overall package a little bit of a mixed bag, I could still give a lot of kudos to everybody who managed to make the best out of their roles. And even though there were some criticisms I had with certain singers in their respective roles, I still have to give them credit for what they were able to accomplish tonight. And of course, let's also not forget about the fine singing to be accomplished by Maria Kokareva, Rebecca Valhot, Gonzalo Quinchawal, and Dionysios Abgerinos. They also stood out very well, and I salute them all for their fine musicianship. The conducting done by Pierre Dumousseau was absolutely fine all around. He did tend to conduct certain phrases rather rapidly. There were times that 
the brass did kind of lord over the orchestra. There were occasions where he could use a little bit more precision because there were occasions where he did kind of sound a little bit moddy in certain areas. But Pierre Dumousseau's conducting showed some enthusiasm and some involvement from both the orchestra, the chorus, and the singers. Unless they forget about the chorus, orchestra, and the dancers of the Staatsoper unter den Linden. Everybody was a pro, and there was a lot of great effort to be found from each and every one of the members of the chorus, the orchestra, and the dancers. So overall, while I am quite conflicted with Saimir Pirgu's Idomeneo, such as the tendency to sing in the mask and the tendency to be kind of nasal in his singing, he still had a lot of sufficient charisma, and he also had some really good vocal moments, especially in Fuor del Mar, where despite the fact that he kind of made a lot of funny faces when he sang the coloratura, he was able to launch at some really great high notes, and he was able to be emotionally invested as this king. The major standout was, of course, Andres Moreno Garcia's superbly sung Arbache, who managed to steal the show from Saimir Pirgu's feet, but still did so in a way with charm and charisma, and even worked well off of Saimir Pirgu's steelier lyric tenor voice with everything he's got. The only difference is was that Andres Moreno Garcia was the more superb musician, while Sarmir Pirgu managed to stay strong as a singing actor. I still have to give my fair share of kudos to the other performers, even though some of the quality did manage to be a little bit here and there. Nonetheless, I still have to give my salutes to Friedrich Hammel, Florian Hoffmann, Olga Peretiatko, Anna Stephanie, and Melissa Petit, for their fine efforts in their respective roles, even though there were some occasions where they could show a lot more improvement. Furthermore, the smaller roles accomplished by Maria Kokareva, Rebecca Weilhut, Gonzalo Quinchawal, and Dionysos Argerinos were finally sung all the way through. And for those of you who caught this performance of Mozart's Idomeneo at the Staatsoper Unter den Linden, what'd you think of it? Did you really enjoy Saimir Pirgu as Idomeneo? Did you really love the way he was able to launch at those top notes while also sing the entirety of this role? Did you also feel that Andres Moreno Garcia stole the show as Arbache, all thanks to his beautiful musicianship and great use of legato singing, and of course, that covered chest tones and that covered voice that made him stand out so superbly? Or did you feel like the singing was not really to your liking? Please comment below and let me know. Well, that's it for my review of Mozart's Idomeneo at the Staatsoper Unter den Linden starring Saimir Pirgu as Idomeneo. Tune in tomorrow for my review of Hopefully, Verdi's Aida, the Staatsoper unter den Linden, starring Evmod Ubo as Ameris, as she was also another singer who took over and indisposed Ketevan Kemoklitze. So until then, good night, everybody.